This lecture is being brought to you in part by the generous gifts of these sponsors. Yeah, thanks to Lori for that nice introduction and really nice to be with all of you in Ocala. You know, I've been down here to work with IHMC over the years, over the last 10 years. So I've been here a couple of times before, but it's been a long time since before uh, uh, COVID kicked off, before, since I've been in Ocala. So it's nice to come back. Nice to enjoy some nice sunny weather in Florida. This weekend, I'm going to go see my grandkids in Atlanta, and it's going to be like, the high is going to be 53 or something. So there's this huge front coming down that's going to spoil the weekend in Atlanta, but I'll have my, my grandkids with me, so that'll be fun. So glad to be back with all of you and to share some perspective on where we're going to go in space. Uh, it's a big arena of competition between the U.S. and our adversaries, and in particular, China is a rising power in space. We're going to talk a little bit about their program and uh, the U.S. efforts to maintain what we have now, which is the world leadership in space exploration, and the importance of doing that. I think it's a very important field of strategic competition between our countries and other potential adversaries, and uh, success in that field, I think, will dominate the success and our, our future success here in the 21st century for our, for our economy and for our kids and their opportunities. And I, I really think it's important that we maintain our um, abilities in this field. So I'm going to talk about uh, a variety of topics uh, dealing with current space exploration. We'll talk about um, the rise of the commercial space programs that we see you know, occupying a lot of the news these days. That's a lot of fun things going on in the U.S. The U.S. has the most vibrant commercial space sector on the planet. <laughs> And I would like to see it remain that way for the decades to come. It's so important to our future to be innovators, to be entrepreneurs, to help the government space program forward with our uh, commercial efforts. And we'll talk about specifically our efforts to go back to the moon uh, and return there and, and why we're going to do that job. And then finally, we'll talk about beyond the Earth-Moon system, where we're going to go in the solar system in the 21st century. It's quite exciting. A lot of big scientific questions to answer. And as again, it's a quite important uh, enterprise for our country and our partners around the world. It, it's impossible to do these kinds of big-scale space efforts like going to the surface of Mars unless we have our partners involved. And fortunately, we have a good model for that, and that's the International Space Station. Uh, which is an international project. So that's where I want to start. You know, my experiences in space, I had four missions on the shuttle, which retired 2011. That's more than 10 years ago the space shuttle went away. It's hard for me to believe that that much time has gone by. But my experience was riding the shuttle to and from space to do my work up there. And on my last trip, I had four trips to, I'm sorry, I had on my fourth trip, I had uh, a visit to the International Space Station to help build that outpost out there, which is, you know, the permanent home for research uh, and technology testing in Earth orbit. And it's been up there with a crew on board since 2020. I got to visit in 2001. I'm sorry, 2020. I meant 2000. I got to visit it in 2001. And now it's 2023. We've had, a, we've had people living in space on the space station continuously since that time. And I think it's a pretty safe bet to say that humanity is going to continue to have people living off the planet for the foreseeable future. And that's an important thing for us as a human species, and we'll talk about that down the line. So I helped build the space station. Here's a little video of a space shuttle pulling away from the space station near the end of its construction uh, and before the shuttle retired. And so it's circling the Earth up there every 90 minutes. It's about 240 miles above the planet. Uh, it's equipped with living space that's equivalent to about the interior volume of a Boeing 747 airliner. So there's a lot of elbow room up, up there. Some of the people who work on the space station don't see anybody for several hours at a time while they're working in the laboratories up there because there's room to spread out. It's quite a contrast with the, the tight confines of the space shuttle orbiters that I flew on. So four big laboratories up there. There are an American lab, Destiny, which I helped put in place. There's a European lab, a Japanese lab. And the Russians have recently added in the last two years uh, a research lab at, the, at their segment of the space station where their cosmonauts do a lot of their research work as well. Four big solar panels that you see at either end of the truss. They provide all the juice for running the laboratories and running the life support system up there. It's um, 240 miles up. You know, you can get to it in less than a day, uh, depending on how your orbits are arranged. And then you can come home in an emergency within a couple of hours. So you get in your lifeboat and you can come back. So it's off planet, but it's not too far away. So it's a very good place to test our ability to live off planet 
for sustained periods of time. And the crews up there have grown in size from three, the original space station Expedition 1, to Expedition 68 today. Uh, and that means the 68th uh, team of astronauts to live aboard. And they stay now for a normal tour of six months, but the crews are, have grown in size up to seven people. So there's usually seven astronauts aboard the International Space Station. Uh, when I saw it, it was still growing. This is the completed configuration of the space station, and it's a wonderful place for us to jump off from as we think of going deeper into space. The point of starting the talk with the space station here is to, to note that it's going to be a viable research lab for about the next seven years. Uh, the international partners have all agreed to support it until 2030, seven years from now. And yeah, I think even the Russians, uh, surprisingly, are going to hang around on the space station for that long. They've, they've insulted us over the, the last you know, year since the Ukraine by saying we're going to pull out of the space station program, but that's actually their only sp space program that the Russians have. So I think they're going to stay with us. And so far, on an operational day-to-day -day level, the Russians have stood up and met every requirement and obligation that they have on the space station program. Here's a, an idea of how big it is. Pretty amazing, almost a million pounds of mass in orbit. It's the largest space structure by far ever built up there. And it's the longest lived space station that's ever been built. We had Skylab in the 70s. The Russians started with their Salyuts and the Mir. But this has far exceeded those in lifetime. And it's better engineered. And we've learned more about living in space and maintaining a facility like this. So it's, it's been very long lived. And for example, the Destiny Science Lab that, that I took up to the station is um, right in the center of the screen. Let me see if I can get this cursor to work. OK, well, here, here it comes. There we go. So here's Destiny, the science lab that my crew delivered. It had a 15-year a design lifetime. It went up in 2001. <laughs> so no cracks, no leaks. It's still running fine. So a lot of the components of the station will live out till 2030. Some will have to be retired at that point, and the space station's going to scheme towards a, a, a retirement in 2030, and we'll talk about the future options for it. What's going on on the space station? You know, there's seven people living up there all the time. We never even hear about them in the news. Um, there's a whole lot of science going on on those four laboratories, and these are just a few of my favorite examples of what's going on. In the upper left, there's a, the Cardinal Heart investigation, which recently uh, arrived on the station. So they're growing heart muscle cells in a culture on the International Space Station. And without the influence of gravity in free fall, those cells can grow in three dimensions, not just a flat bottom of a Petri dish. And so in three dimensions, those heart cells beat. And we're testing whether we see observable changes in those heart cells function with free fall, weightlessness, the answer is, yes, we do. Uh, the second question, that the second phase of the investigation going on now is, will pharmaceuticals be able to stop those deleterious changes in the heart muscles from occurring? Then later on, you might think of an extension of this with growing uh, heart cell tissue in free fall in realistic three-dimensional forms. Maybe they could be implanted in people back here on the ground. So a future laboratory in space might be making artificial heart tissue and bringing it back to the, the Earth for our use. Upper right, there's the veggie chamber. This is sort of prosaic. You know, we all like fresh vegetables. It's hard to grow things in space, but it's the key to a future of a self-sustaining outpost on the moon or Mars someday. And so you would like to have a greenhouse full of fresh food growing on your space facility somewhere. And here in weightlessness, they're growing, those are dwarf tomato plants, and they've had radishes and wheat plants and zinnias and things like that growing in space previous to this, but you know, those are ed edible tomatoes, and they're trying to see whether they can grow tasty tomatoes. That's one point of the uh, investigation to help supply the crew with some variety. But of course, plants recycle carbon dioxide, they emit oxygen. So here's a way to make a greenhouse part of the life support system of a future space outpost. So that's ongoing, and the crews really like to have fresh vegetables and green things growing in their sterile laboratory environment up there. Lower left corner is the dark matter experiment called the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. It's a uh, cosmic ray detector that's on the outside of the space station, and it detects high-speed cosmic rays coming across the galaxy that are striking the detector. Our atmosphere screens out almost all of them before they hit the ground where we are. That's good for our DNA. But those high-speed particles can be detected on the station free of the atmosphere. We can measure the energy spectrum 
low energy, high energy, how heavy they are, and the spectrometer itself can then give us some idea of the origin and direction of these high energy sources of cosmic rays. And they're coming from supernova across the galaxy, and some of them are positrons, they're antimatter. And of course, if antimatter touches matter, there's an explosion. They're detecting some of those particles before they can strike our matter-composed atmosphere, and we're measuring the production of positrons across the galaxy. Some of them appear to be coming from dark matter or dark energy, which makes up 80 plus percent of the universe, and we know very little about it. So we're you know, living in a world of matter. Um, antimatter is not very prevalent down here unless you have a particle accelerator to make experiments. But the point is, we're learning more about the true nature of the universe by this experiment mounted on the ISS. And then in the lower right corner, IH, IHMC fans can stand up and cheer. There's an advanced robotics experiment going on on the space station with uh, something called the Astro B uh, suite of uh, robots. So there's one, there's another one. These are little boxes that are battery charged. There you go, Abigail's got the, the spirit. So these are little robots that are charged up on a docking station and they can free fly through the space station and underground or astronaut control. And so while the astronauts are asleep, those little robots can float around on their little fans and battery powered fans will propel them through the space station. They can sample the air, they can listen for sound, uh, they can measure the sound levels, they can take bacterial swabs of the in surfaces of the station. They can do a lot of inspecting and camera work that the astronauts will then be freed up from doing. So they're little robot assistants that are being checked out on the ISS. And you can imagine larger, more capable robots taking the roles of mundane astronaut jobs in the future. You know, I would not like to spend my 10-hour workday on the space station, you know, taking bacterial swabs off the surface. I'd like to be involved in growing tomatoes, you know, something exciting like that. So some advanced robotics continuing to check out how robots can be our assistants up there in the future. The people doing the work, there's always seven of them up there in these days. And this is the current crew that's been resident on the station for the last few months. Uh, it's an international space station, so international crew. The main partners are U.S. and Russia. So we have two Russians over here. We've got um, Dmitry and Sergei, and this is their comrade uh, Anna over here. Um, they're the three Russians on board the station. The NASA people are Nicole Mann and Josh Casada and Frank Rubio. And I think today, tonight, um, Frank and Anna and no, it's not sorry, not Frank, but Anna and Josh, and Nicole, and Koichi Wakata from Japan, they're all coming home on their Crew Dragon spacecraft. So splash down in the next 24 hours. Uh, a recent launch last week put another crew of four up there. They're not in this picture, but they'll be taking over the places of these guys. So there's a crew rotation about every three months, and then the crew is constantly at a level of seven. During the handovers, there's now 11 people up there on the station until those folks come home uh, very soon. So. You get your six-month tour in. That's about the standard medical uh, exposure to free fall and radiation that we're comfortable with. But we have some future volunteers who are going to spend another one-year tour on the space station in the next year or so. Uh, Don Pettit, one of my friends, has volunteered for that. So we're checking out the endurance and performance of humans in that strange, weightless environment. Uh, it's a higher radiation level than we are used to on the ground. Uh, we're trying to investigate all the medical aspects of long duration weightlessness. There's some fun aspects of being weightless for a few days or months up there. Here's me flying down the, the aisles of the Destiny Science Lab. Uh, that's when we installed it back in 01. It's almost an empty container, just a few life support system and electronics racks involved. But it's now looking like this. That's Destiny today. And so the next crew that goes up to the space station, well, I hope will include um, Marie Kondo from Japan to organize all that stuff up there. <laughs> You know, they need a home organizer up there to keep it all straight. It's crammed with all the science gear, cameras, the robot arm controls. A lot of the American science experiments are in there, plus the computers that actually operate the space station are resident in uh, Destiny. So the crews go to work there every day. It's very gratifying to me that I had a hand in installing that facility, and now it's still the, the, the brains, the centerpiece of the space station today. So glad to see Destiny carrying on. It's right at the center of the, the station right here. And we have the Japanese lab, the European lab, the American lab, and then, of course, the, the Russians have added a, a chunk back here called the Nauka Science Lab. Four big solar panels, as I mentioned. These are the thermal radiators that help control the temperature inside the station. And it's got docking ports all over it for the supply ships that come up there. Um, the Chinese have a space station. 
They've just launched it in the past three years and have added a couple of modules to it. This is one of the, the Taikonauts up there on the Tiangong Space Station. And we don't hear much about it here in the West, but they've had several successions of crews of three going up there on their Shenzhou spacecraft. And so when the ISS retires in 2030, this facility is still going to be there. And we would not like to see here in the West uh, a situation where low Earth orbit is only ha inhabited by Chinese Taikonauts dominating uh, the low Earth space. So we'd like to see parts of the ISS continue on after 2030 uh, into a spin-off set of space stations that are going to be built by the commercial sector. This is one that's uh, um, on pretty good momentum towards the future. It's the Axiom Company, and they're going to add on modules to the front of the ISS and then have their crews go up periodically to activate and install those modules. And they'll rent out their living and research space to tenants from Earth who will come up and do things like put experiments up there. Tom Cruise wants to film a movie up there. He's going to be renting space probably with his production company. I heard he wants to skydive off the space station. <laughs> so I'd, I'd, I'd pay to go see that. So Axiom Space, in 2030, they plan to take their modules and spin off from the station as it retires and continue on as a commercial facility. And then there's a, the Blue Origin Company, Jeff Bezos' company. They want to build the Orbital Reef Space Station, which is going to be a, another commercial entity up there in the latter half of the 2020s. So we're supplying the current space station with commercial uh, supply ships on commercial vehicles. The Russians had a monopoly on space travel up to the station once the shuttle retired for about 10 years on their Soyuz rocket on the left here. Um, but we've gotten ourselves back up on our feet with American spacecraft starting in 2020. The Crew Dragon there in the middle was the first transport under commercial uh, auspices to be hired by NASA to take astronauts up to the station. That's how we're getting back and forth now. And a second crew transport is the Boeing Starliner on the right, and that is a, another independent way of transport. Uh, it's had two test flights. The, the crewed flight is sometime this spring with Boeing, April or May, when a crew will go up to the station and stay for six months. So we'll have two ways of getting there. And that gets us up to the station 240 miles up, and those two spacecraft can be used to fly other experiments to independent laboratories, or they can fly tourists to space. And as you know, there have been a couple of private space missions that have flown um, up to the, the ISS or on independent missions. But I'm sort of getting a little ahead of my story because this commercial space story uh, started way back in 2004 when the Ansari X Prize was offered to the first um, institution to or team to put together a flight to the boundary of space, 62 miles up, 100 kilometers up, and then get back on the ground and fly again within two weeks. And the winner of that X Prize was the Spaceship One. You might remember that. Um, it took a couple of test pilots up to the edge of space twice in two weeks. And the descendant of Spaceship One is Spaceship Two, and it's been flown since the beginning by um, Virgin Galactic out of New Mexico. So these are companies that are trying to promote space tourism and, you know, again, broaden the base of commercial space activity in the U.S. So Virgin Galactic has Spaceship Two, and they've done the job of flying tourists into space, not this past summer, but in 2021, they flew a couple of missions uh, with Richard Branson, and there he is floating inside his space plane, launching from New, from New Mexico up to near space, the official boundary of space, and then coming back. They get about five minutes of weightlessness on this cannonball shot up to the edge of space and back, and then the plane glides in for a runway landing. So superb view of the Earth, no doubt. Five minutes of weightlessness. It's a big thrill ride for you know some very rich people. I think his. His price point is $250,000 per ticket. Um, so save up. I've got some loose change in my pocket. I'm working my way towards that. So kudos to, to Branson. He was not the first guy to get up there to near Earth space. It was, it was Jeff Bezos, right? And here's Bezos and his New Shepard rocket, West Texas. So there goes the um, New Shepard. It's got a capsule on the top. The rocket is reusable. Go, 
So that's why your Amazon prices have gone up lately. <laughs> so that was a successful mission, and he's, he's flown a couple of other tourist missions to the edge of space since then. Here's Captain Kirk on the right, over there against the window with the, his colleagues at the edge of space, 62 miles up. Pretty amazing. Warp 10, Mr. Sulu. So I'd love to go up there. You know, I, I have a book in the back called Ask the Astronaut, and one of the questions in my book, Ask the Astronaut, is, will you get to go to space again? And my answer in the book is, not if I want to stay married to the same woman. <laughs> so I got four trips to space. I think that's all that Liz is, is uh, going to approve for me. But maybe I'll see some of you guys up there on those trips. So New Shepard comes back, the booster's reusable, and the space capsule comes back under parachutes, and that's how William Shatner and Jeff Bezos have gone up and down. So they're successful, they're operating, and um, uh, Virgin Galactic is supposed to start up flights again this year as well. So that takes care of the cannonball style of tourism, and there's going to be some shakeout. Maybe only one of those companies will survive financially. Who knows? But uh, Bezos wants to move on to orbital flight, and Virgin Galactic has plans to maybe to take their space plane up a notch and eventually see orbital travel on that as well. But NASA got into this game around 2010 uh, with commercial cargo shipments to the space station using rockets like the Falcon 9 and the, the Antares. And so, you know, NASA's been paying um, commercial companies like this to ship cargo to the space station for the last uh, more than 10 years. Uh, about 2015 is when they began. So we've been under um, commercial cargo support since then, and that has extended now to astronaut transport, as I mentioned, since 2020. That's the Falcon 9 with a, a crew dragon on top. And they're flying off a leased launch pad, pad 39A, where Neil and Buzz and Mike left to go to the moon in 1969. I flew off that pad three times on the shuttle, and now it's been transformed again to carry um, SpaceX Falcon 9s off, and later the home of the big Starship rocket we'll talk about in a minute. So it's nice to see uh, the commercial sector here supporting the space station. That's a close-up of the Crew Dragon, uh, and there's one parked at the space station right now which is due to come home, and the other one had just arrived to bring the new crew up. And this is a, a private space sortie on um, a Crew Dragon that arrived at the space station back in 21, no, early 2022. This is the Axiom 1 mission. The guy at the lower part of the screen is Mike uh, L.A., Lopez Alegria, and he's uh, one of my astronaut colleagues. He retired from NASA. Now he's their chief astronaut at Axiom Space. So he led this mission up to the space station with three paying customers who are you know, private space explorers, if you will. And they're getting set for their space station modules to arrive. Um, with the Boeing Starliner, you're going to have another way to get tourists to space, private space missions. And uh, eventually, you know, Elon Musk and his company, they're going to be flying tourists around the moon within the next 10 years. I'm, I'm confident of that. So it's not a risk-free, guaranteed trip, but it's a, 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 certainly a, an adventure opportunity for a lot of wealthy individuals. There's a third company called Sierra Space that's going to fly cargo to the station with their uh, Dream Chaser ship. It's a, a robotic space plane that will land on a runway, which... From my experience, that's the only way to come back from space, is land on a runway. It's the Cadillac of, of uh, re-entries. I don't like to plop down in the ocean under parachutes. I like landing on a, a runway. So this one does that, and eventually it's going to be a crew transport for private space stations like Ocean Reef, uh, for example. So that one you'll see flying in just the next year or two. But, so that takes care of supporting low Earth orbit in the space station for the next 10 years or so. And we'll see those same vehicles be used for tourist travel as well as these new private space stations that are com com coming along. You know, when the space station retires, um, NASA will go rent space on some of those commercial stations to do the research that it needs to do after the, the space station is phased out. Now we're going to talk about a thousand times farther out, 240 miles for the space station, 240,000 miles for the moon. That's the distance that the Apollo astronauts uh, journeyed on their epic voyages 50 years ago. And that's what got me inspired to become an astronaut one day. So we're going to go back to deep space. That's the national goal of the Congress and the president right now is to see Americans and our partners back on the surface of the moon in the middle 2020s. Uh, I think Trump had announced he wanted to do it by 2024. 
That's really not technically possible uh, given the budgets that NASA has, but pretty soon after that, we should be able to, to pursue that goal very um, successfully, I think. And the, the steps that we've been making have been long in coming. Um, thumbnail history, you know, there was a return to the moon program back in the 2000s under President Bush II. It was canceled by President Obama. That went away. And instead he said, we're going to do a focus on the space station, retire the shuttle, and then go on off to an asteroid and then to Mars. The Congress didn't like that, and they replaced uh, some of those goals with the near-term goal of building a, a heavy rocket and a deep space capable craft that could go out into the lunar vicinity um, within the next 10 years. So I think that program kicked off 2012 with the Congress dictating that NASA build a deep spaceship and it didn't fly until 2022. 10 years of development to get the Orion craft. Let's talk about how we're gonna go back to the moon. Um, first of all, why are we sending people to the moon in the first place or out into deep space? Um, there's a couple answers that I can give you for that. Um, humans, as we all look, we look at the audience today, we're all amazing creatures and extraordinary adaptable organisms. And we send people out into space to take advantage of those properties, okay? On the left, you know, you send people to explore new planets. That's uh, Jim Irwin on Apollo 15. So you send human explorers to go to a new world, the moon back in the 60s and 70s, Mars eventually, maybe the asteroids in between, to explore totally unknown environments. We're very good at doing that. We've been exploring the corners of the Earth for the last few millennia and successfully taking advantage of those new resources there. The other thing that we can do with humans in space is we can fix things. We can MacGyver our way out of a lot of problems. And that's my friend Scott Perzinski up on the space station uh, back in about 2010. And there was a solar panel. If you look closely at the top of the screen, this one's torn and ripped by a faulty extension mechanism on that solar panel. So they had the crew that was there at the time on the shuttle rig up some makeshift uh, Anchors, they call them cufflinks because they had fasteners on the, on the end that resembled cufflinks with about a, a, a yard of cable between them. And then Scott went out there on the end of a 100-foot robot arm and rigged those cufflinks to stitch that damaged solar panel back together and complete the extension. There's, there's no robot on Earth in 2023 that could do that job. But they were on scene, they had the materials, they had the improvisational skills, help from mission control, and they got that solar panel stitched back together, it's still in operation producing electricity today. So we can fix things, we can adapt to un unexpected situations in space. Your odds of completing a mission successfully, scientific exploration, are way higher if you have people there. It's more expensive, it's more dangerous to the people, but your odds of mission success go way up if you have humans on the scene. So, we're doing that, sending humans out to those critical places and situations with this new deep space craft called Orion. So this is a NASA-owned craft, it's government-owned, just like the shuttle was, being built over in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center. And Orion has had two test flights. The last one was in November. And some of you on checking out the news on the space front might have watched the, the mission of the second Orion to fly in space. It was called the Artemis One mission, and it launched on November 16th. Now, it's a bigger, heavier craft. It has four seats, can go all the way out to the moon for about a month on the supplies contained in that ship. So it's heavier than the old Apollo craft and it requires a bigger rocket to, to fly. And that's the new space launch system, or as some WAGs called it, the Senate launch system because they were the ones who dictated that NASA build this. But it's bigger than the old shuttle by a long shot. Derived from shuttle technology, you can recognize the solid rocket boosters on the sides, the orange tank, similar to the shuttle but it's a lot bigger and more powerful. Here's a, an idea of how big it is compared to my old space shuttle. And it's derived from shuttle technology, but it's blown up. It's got four engines instead of three on the main central core, and it has two bigger, longer, more powerful solid rocket motors stitched to the sides to get that Orion all the way out to the moon. And that's what it looked like on November 16th when that new rocket flew for the first time, about five years behind schedule. So NASA had a lot of problems designing and manufacturing the rocket with its contractors. Uh, a long test program last year to get it ready for flight, but they finally got it off the ground. So Space Launch System Artemis I took off on a three and a half week mission, uh, unpiloted to the moon. And no people were aboard this flight because it's the brand new 
first flight of a rocket, and you don't put people on a brand new untested rocket if you can help it. So um, Orion, Artemis 1, unpiloted, an empty crew cabin. If you missed the middle of the night launch, this is how it looked. That's 8.8 .8 million pounds of rocket thrust. The shuttle had seven. The old Saturn V had seven and a half million pounds. This is bigger by far and more powerful at takeoff. So it got into Earth orbit. The second stage of the rocket kicked the Orion stage all the way out to uh, the vicinity of the moon where the Orion spacecraft looped around the far side of the moon. That's a selfie that the spacecraft took on its way past the moon. And, you know, no human has seen this view since 1972 when Apollo 17 flew. This is from the robot cameras on Orion. That's one of the front side seas of the moon called the Ocean of Storms. And then it whipped around the moon and looked back at the moon and the Earth in the same camera frame. So that's pretty amazing. It was 270,000 miles out there, 30,000 miles past the moon. No Apollo astronauts went out this far. So when humans do fly on the Orion on the next mission, they're going to get a vista something as stunning as this. So it's going to be pretty impressive to see. On the way back towards Earth, they whipped by the moon to correct their trajectory. That's the Earth on the right, that little sliver of a crescent. That's the Earth. And there's the moon's landscape as it swept by on the way back home. So it was gone for three and a half weeks. The spacecraft worked very well, splashed down in the Pacific Ocean and was recovered by a Navy vessel out there. So we've got the Orion back here in Florida at the Space Center. It's being checked out, uh, looking at the, the heat shield and how it did at the 5,000 degree temperatures it experienced on the way back in. All the indications so far, NASA had a briefing this week, were that it's performed well enough that they can schedule the crew launch of Artemis II for November of 2024, two years from now, and they'll send a crew of four out to lunar orbit. And that crew will go in on a, a loop around the moon that'll take them about 10 days altogether. And so we'll have astronauts seeing Earth rise like this for the first time since 1972. So that'll be quite exciting. I missed the Artemis 1 launch. Anybody go? Anybody here go to the Cape to see that? So you saw it from here. Okay. It was the middle of the night. It should have been easy to see, right? But uh, there's nothing like a mammoth moon rocket going off three miles away from you. So I'm going to go there in November of 24 to see that, that next launch. I hope a lot of you will come and see that too. I predict they'll, they'll have 500,000 people over there uh, when they launch that rocket. Well, if it goes well, the Orion will fly again on Artemis III, and it will meet up in lunar orbit with the Starship lander that Elon Musk and his company are building. Um, and that's the vehicle that will take them down to the uh, surface of the moon. So 2026-ish is when this should be possible if the testing comes along. Um, the Starship is Elon's new uh, upper stage, more powerful rocket that he's going to use to launch satellites, and he's going to adapt it to land on the moon as well and do this job for NASA. NASA's got some other industry competitors that are seeking uh, follow-on contracts in case uh, Elon and SpaceX falter, but I'm wishing them well. I hope that they do get off the ground. This is, um, this is a real photo on the left of his um, Starship booster. The bottom part's called the Super Heavy, the top part's called the Starship. That would become the Lunar Lander. So this is South Texas. That rocket is almost 400 feet tall. It's way bigger than the, our, the Space Launch System, and it's way bigger than the Saturn V. Uh, at the lower right, you see the 33 rocket engines on the first stage. What could go wrong? <laughs> but they're, they're pretty proven engines. They're called the, the... I think they're called the... They're, they burn methane and liquid oxygen, and they're not the, the they're Raptor engines, Raptor engines. 33 of them, and they'll generate altogether 16 million pounds of rocket thrust. So almost double the new NASA moon rocket. And up in the upper right, as you see an earlier test of the Starship upper stage, when it came back to land successfully at the, the launch site there in South Texas. So this is the combination that he wants to use to furnish the lunar lander, and then also um, promote satellite launches and fly people from New York to Tokyo in 90 minutes, you know, that kind of thing. So that's his new concept. Blue, Blue Origin, Jeff Bezos has another big heavy lifter coming along. If all that works out, we'll have people back on the moon in the mid-2020s. And then beyond that, we're going to build this little space station in, low Earth, in lunar orbit uh, called the, the Gateway. 
And about twice a year, you might see a crew go up to the gateway in the Orion, hang out there for a week or so. Their lander will arrive or be waiting for them. You transfer to the lander, go down to the moon, stay a few weeks, come back up, get in your Orion, and come back home. So that's the operations base for lunar exploration in the coming decade or so. And the, the equipment that we haul to the moon on the, on the uh, space launch system, the Artemis system, and maybe on the Starship will allow us to establish a permanent presence on the moon. But we're not in this uh, visit to the moon alone. The Chinese are a very, um, a very impressive space competitor. They've been rapidly catching up with us. You know, they started back um, in the 2000s with their first human space flights, and they very quickly duplicated our Gemini and our um, space station efforts. They had an early space station that was like our Skylab. Now they have that Tiangong space station, and they're flying crews up there regularly, and they want to go to the moon. And they think that any decent space power has to be able to match what the West has done to call themselves a global superpower, and that's their ambition. So they think by competing in space, they can prove to the rest of the world how successful their system is, their economy is, and they're doing it. So this is a, a model on the left of their Long March 9 rocket, which is in the same class as the Artemis rocket. And on the right is a model that was just unveiled about two weeks ago of their lunar lander that's going to carry a crew down to the surface in about 2030. Uh, you can even see the, the hatch right here on the side of the lander with a ladder going down the leg. So it looks a lot like the old Apollo system. So they're just going to do what we did with Apollo. Uh, but if they're the only ones doing that, that's a message to the rest of the world that they are the preeminent technological power on the planet. You know, we can talk about hypersonic missiles and their, their ambitions to take over the South China Sea, but this is a peaceful way for them to demonstrate that they are the preeminent technological power on the planet. So they're aiming to go there, and I think that we should be there to say, congratulations, welcome to the moon. <laughs> and, you know, that would be only fitting. You know, we were there 50 years ago, uh, and we want to say welcome to the, the whole game of lunar exploration. Become our partner. Join our coalition to explore the moon and tap into its resources that are out there. And be a partner in this journey rather than a competitor. So let's congratulate them when they make it, but let's be in a position where we can invite them to join the team. And why do we want to go back to the moon and, and have the Chinese as our partners? Okay, so the reasons for going to the moon are not only to continue the scientific exploration of that body. You know, the Apollo guys just scratched the surface and the few robots that have gone since, they have not gotten to the bottom of the history of the moon as our twin planet. It's been here since the Earth formed, or very shortly thereafter. And it's experienced everything that the Earth has experienced. So by unraveling the history of the moon, we understand what has happened on our planet, which has been erased by the active geology on the Earth, volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, and all of that, and weathering and erosion. So the history of the moon can be read off the tape recorder of lunar history up there, and we can inform ourselves about our home planet. Uh, but it's also about the resources that are out there. So we need to take in these celestial bodies and make them part of our economic base. Um, there are resources that are out there to use in space on the moon, closest by, on the nearby asteroids, and there's a lot of knowledge to be gained in the journey to and from and on the surface of Mars. So we want to include all of those resources, both knowledge and physical resources, in our economic and uh, um, our our knowledge base here on Earth. Going to the moon, the south and north poles of the moon have very prominent craters at the poles that are always in permanent shadow. The sun never gets to shine into the, the floors of those craters. And those super cold, darkened craters have got frozen in their bottoms millions of tons, hundreds of millions of tons of water ice that we've detected from our robot explorers in orbit around the moon. So it's just this, it's just water. Pretty ordinary stuff. But on the space shuttle, a liter of this stuff cost $20,000 to send to the space station. The shuttle was pretty expensive. Elon Musk has the price down to about $2,500 for a liter of water to go up there. And that commercial competition is gonna drop it further. But why do we have to drag it all the way from Earth to the space station, to the moon, an outpost out there, even to Mars? There's no economical way to do that. We want to use the resources that are out there. So we want to melt the water 
in those South and North Pole craters. Here's the blue speckles are the places at the South Pole and the North Pole where ice deposits have been found. And so we want to go to those places and then extract the water. It's going to be dirty, murky, muddy water, but you can process it into to drinking water and you can crack it with electricity into oxygen and hydrogen, right? And so that's what we burn on the shuttle and on the space launch system. Oxygen and hydrogen power the engines on those things. And of course, if you have oxygen, you can breathe it. If you're an astronaut, that's pretty important to have up there too. So a lot of the life support supplies that we need can come from the poles of the moon. And this reminds me of the, the expedition to the Pacific by Lewis and Clark in 1804 to 1806. Thomas Jefferson sent the expedition, the Corps of Discovery, across the continent. And this was his orders. He wrote Meriwether Lewis this message that says, the object of your mission is to explore the Missouri River and the streams of it by its course in communication with the waters of the Pacific Ocean. And that may offer the most direct and practicable water communications across the continent. Last line is the most important. I should have underlined it. For the purposes of commerce. So he, you know, Jefferson and the country wanted to learn about the plants and the buffalo and the bison and the gazelles and the, the antelope out there. Not the gazelles, that's Africa. <laughs> antelope. But that was all scientific, but he wanted to know the communications route for commercial expansion to the west, to the Pacific Ocean. And that was the imperative of the Louisiana Purchase is to increase the, the economic base of the young United States. So now we want to go out into space for commercial purposes to increase the resources available to our economy and those of our partners, okay? Now, we hear a lot of talk about the limitations of the resources on the Earth and how much population it can support and whether we're going to run out of fossil fuels and so on. There's no limit to the resources that humanity, humanity can tap into. It's just not here on the Earth. It's at the moon. It's in the asteroids. It's on other planets. Uh, you can't run out of iron uh, or solar energy if you go out into space and tap into it. So we've got the idea now of getting after these water resources first on the moon. So there's a robot that's going to go up in 2024 called Viper, which is going to investigate where these water deposits are on the ground on the moon. Scratch the surface, find out whether it's snowflakes or snow pellets or beds of ice. How is that water stored on the floors of these dark craters? And then with that knowledge, when the astronauts get up there, they'll be able to help set up commercial mining facilities on the moon. And you use solar energy like this, or you use nuclear power, you melt the ice, process it, now you've got rocket fuel, drinking water, oxygen, and so on. And then later on comes extracting titanium and other more uh, mundane construction materials from the dirt up there on the moon. So all of that can come with uh, an establishment on the moon and our, our um, commercial and robotic partners up there. We might even use the nearby asteroids that come close to the Earth and the moon system, like in this painting, send astronauts out to help robots get set up to process the minerals on asteroids that do contain water, some of them as much as 20%. There's a uh, photo sequence here of the asteroid Bennu that one of our NASA probes vi visited recently. It's very dark, it's almost like coal in terms of its brightness. And the sample is headed back to land on uh, a Utah desert in October of this year. So we'll get a, a look at what Bennu is made of, but we already know from remote sensing that it's probably about 10% water by weight. The, the meteorite fragment on the left, a chunk of an asteroid, landed in Australia back in the 60s. It's 10% water by weight. And the little sample that you see on the bottom right brought back from the Japanese probe that went to the asteroid Ryugu, it found that that asteroid is wet as well. The meteorite on the upper right, Tagish Lake, landed in Canada in 2000, 2001. It's 20% water. So the stuff just has to be squeezed with your hand and the drops are going to come out of your fist. So these are filling stations on the way to deep space. You can take the dirt on Mars. These are simulated Mars and lunar samples. Uh, but you can forge them with 3D printing into useful tools. We can just do that with the dirt that's up there. Uh, but then we can use the fluids, uh, water deposits, uh, that are very plentiful on the moon, on the asteroids occasionally. And Mars has got lots of water ice locked up on it. So long term, looking down through the 21st century here, we can begin to use these resources to really impact our lives back here on the Earth, not just keep astronauts alive. So here's a nighttime satellite picture of the US and its electricity grid. And we have 24-7 power, thanks be to God, and a lot of ingenuity on Thomas Edison's part and other uh, innovators. 
So we have this wonderful situation where we have this grid, but the population is growing around the world. There are a billion people on the planet that do not have a grid at all. A billion people. They don't have power. They burn uh, sticks or coal or animal dung to cook their food. So for them to raise their standard of living, they're going to need um, electricity supplies just like we have. And I don't think renewables are going to do that for them uh, rapidly enough. I think nuclear power is the ground-based source that would do that for them. But there's another way we can augment our energy needs. This graph just shows you that by 2050 at the far right, we're going to increase our energy demand on Earth by about 50% over what it was in 2020. And where's that extra energy going to come from? I'd like to see us use nuclear power, but renewables will be a part of that as well. But we might get it from space. We might collect solar energy above the planet, turn it into microwaves and beam it down to the ground, and then feed it into the electricity grid here on the ground with a converting system. Now, the business case for this is not at all clear whether it's profitable or doable. One of the big stumbling blocks to building solar power collectors in space is that to launch all that kilometer-wide collecting area for an individual satellite, it's going to take a lot of launching expense to get all that material up there to build a satellite like that. Very heavy, very expensive to launch. But you might be able to get rid of that problem by using the materials that are out there on the moon or the nearby asteroids and build your construction materials in space to assemble those solar panels, solar mirrors, and uh, converters to make the electricity go into microwaves. And so, by 2075, you might have this kind of operation feeding a, a major part of our grid. Now, that seems like science fiction. It's, it's very far-fetched. But that's 50 years from now. When Thomas Edison invented the light bulb in about you know, 1875, nobody imagined that 50 years later in the 1920s, everybody would have an electric fridge an electric washing machine, electric toasters, and so on, and electric lights through every room in the house. Okay? Nobody envisioned that kind of penetration of electricity into the daily life of Americans. So 50 years from now, we might be surprised to see that this technology could be applied to help us meet our energy needs with using materials off-planet. Okay, we'll wrap up here by talking about Mars and getting humans to Mars to look for life. That's the whole goal of going to Mars. An actual picture of um, the Martian surface on the right from the, the Curiosity rover. Extraordinary landscape. When I was a kid in high school, I was really worried that NASA, which had announced plans to send astronauts to Mars by 1983, I was really worried that I wouldn't grow up fast enough to help them. And I'd miss out on all the fun and excitement. So I needn't have worried. But somebody's going to get there eventually. And let's talk about how that's possible. The um, Perseverance rover is at the floor of this crater called the Yazero Crater, and that's a river delta that you see exposed on the crater floor from an ancient Martian river that flowed from the highlands down into the crater floor. And there was a lake at the bottom of this crater. And that environment of a lake sitting there for millions of years in the early Mars history was the perfect environment for life to get started or be supported. And so, Perseverance is there now checking out the geological evidence of that environment. Are there microbes there? Probably not on the surface where Perseverance can get to them, but they might be 50 yards down at a hot spring underneath the surface, hanging out like life tends to do wherever it can find a foothold. So the robots can't get there, and it's going to take humans to get to the bottom of the astrobiology mystery on Mars. Are we alone? That's the question we're asking fundamentally. Is this the only planet that can support life? Are there other places where that can happen? And then that would give us the answer to, about, to whether the universe is teeming with life or whether we're a real lone, unique oasis here on Earth. Anybody see the movie The Martian? Matt Damon uh, and his intrepid crew. That was a really good story and a, and a fun novel and movie to watch. This was their Mars ship. It was called the, uh, the Hermes. That's Hollywood's version of going to Mars. It's never going to be like this. <laughs> they had a gym like this with big picture windows and eight treadmills to run on, and uh, NASA can't afford that. <laughs> you know, you're going to be running on a treadmill in a sealed can on the way to Mars, and it's never going to be as posh as this. Here's the space station's treadmill. That's Karen Nyberg jogging, and every astronaut on the station, they work out for about two hours every day to counteract the 
deleterious effects of free fall, weightlessness on your body. So she's keeping her cardio health, her muscle health up with running on the treadmill. And then this is um, uh, Aki Hoshide, Japanese astronaut working on the resistive exercise device up there. It allows you to essentially lift weights in a weightless environment. And that loads up your skeleton and prevents you from losing bone mass from your skeleton. Here's another cardio workout with uh, the exercise bike on the station. So that's how the astronauts keep healthy and that they'll have a gym on the way to Mars, but it's not gonna be as posh as the one that Hollywood created. Another way to get around the health problems of free fall is to spin a part of the spaceship. And that donut that you see in this artist concept would be a way to rotate the living quarters and provide artificial gravity, and then you don't have to worry about working out for two hours a day. You could just do your normal half an hour every other day or so and be perfectly fine. So that may be a way, but that makes the spaceship heavier, and that means a bigger check to write when you're buying the spaceship. And nobody wants to do that if you're working for the federal government. They don't want to write a bigger check if they don't have to. How about other hazards up there? There's the radiation from our star, the sun. You know, here on the Earth, we're protected from most of the solar radiation by the atmosphere. You know, we can still get a sunburn, but we don't get too much damage other than that. But solar flares and cosmic rays, they can penetrate your body uh, if there's a solar storm, or cosmic rays come all the time from across the galaxy, and they can break your DNA chains. And they can cause prompt effects like radiation sickness, or you might have mutations that occur in your body that over time will lead to cancer and other bad effects. Being exposed outside the Earth's geomagnetic field, astronauts going to the moon or Mars are subject to this level of radiation hazard. And it's something that you don't get on the space station where you're still well within the Earth's geomagnetic field. So don't worry about the graph too much, but we have radiation worker limits in the US, and that is the, um, um, the DOE radiation worker annual limit is about this much radiation in pink right there. An astronaut for spending six months on the space station gets that much radiation, and so they exceed the, the legal worker limit down here on Earth. And just a one-way trip to Mars for an astronaut would put them past that mark. So you're well outside what we permit radiation workers to experience on the ground, and that's just one way to Mars. And when you get to Mars, there's no protection from those cosmic rays on the surface. You have to live underground to get the shielding. So there is a radiation challenge of getting to Mars. You can shield the spaceship to reduce the exposure level, or you can get there faster and reduce the exposure time. And that's my preference, is to build nuclear engines. Nuclear reactor can heat propellant, throw it out the nozzle at very high speed, and can cut the trip time in half. And NASA and DARPA are working towards developing a demonstration nuclear engine in the next five to 10 years, which may play a role in how we get to Mars someday. Cut the trip time down, reduce the exposure level. Uh, the other thing that we have to overcome is our lack of knowledge about how to land heavy stuff on Mars. Um, the Martian and Hollywood notwithstanding, we don't know how to build a spaceship that can get to the surface of Mars with people on board. The biggest thing we've ever landed is perseverance and curiosity. They weigh about a ton each. They're about the size of a Mini Cooper. So we've been able to put those down, but a crewed spacecraft with all the supplies to exist there, it's gonna take like a 25-ton lander to get down to the surface. We don't know how to build that yet. Elon Musk says he does. He knows how to build it, but he hasn't done it yet either. So there's a big technological challenge about getting the supplies and the people down to the surface in an economical way. That has to be solved over the next 20 years or so. But if we do our homework steadily on the space station, the moon, the asteroids, and then eventually uh, we'll have the skills and the experience to actually launch a Mars expedition. Uh, you might stop at one of the little moons of Mars and build up your logistics base there, a little uh, outpost on Phobos, and then you're only 6,000 miles from taking the final jump down to the surface. You know, we have robots there as scouts ahead of us, but the humans going down there, you've gotta be really ready with all the equipment, all the supplies that you need to assure that you can exist and then get back off the surface when you go. So it's 20 years to get ready for a, a trip like this. Who's gonna go? Any volunteers out there? You know, they're not gonna, like Abigail's ready. They're not gonna call me up, I'm retired from NASA, you know, so, but maybe the, some of the 2022 astronauts that were hired last year, in 20 years, they might be still on the job, senior people, and they'll volunteer to be the first expedition to Mars. Um, that's quite possible that we'll see some of these folks being famous like Neil Armstrong someday. Matt Damon will be too old by then, <laughs> so he's not gonna go. So we need some more capable, young, 
explorers. And that's where NASA's hanging out the recruiting shingle. Um, so we've got Abigail. How old are you again? 11. 11, that's right. So if we're ready to go to Mars in 20 years, I'm glad you came tonight. How old, you, how old will you be in 20 years? 31. 31. She passed the astronaut math test. <laughs> so, you know, we hire people in the NASA astronaut corps as young as 28 or 29. Um, I was 35 when I got hired to go to space, and I didn't fly till I was 39. So you and your slightly older schoolmates are exactly the right age group to be in that picture right there. That's who's going to go to man these expeditions, crew these expeditions to Mars. And it'll probably be an expedition with four or five or six people, international makeup for the crew. Uh, we'll send a physician along because, you know, telemedicine can't cope with everything that you might encounter there. And astrobiologists and geologists and chemists and people to, to engineers to run the equipment and make sure it doesn't fail while you're up there. So there are a lot of new challenges in getting to Mars faced by our nation and our partners that are running the space station right now. And we need some new explorers like Abigail here. But we also have to recognize that there are opportunities out there. The country that first puts an expedition uh, on Mars will say for the rest of the 21st century be the preeminent um, technological power on the planet. And you, you know, we're still coasting. You know, my phone is a residue of the Apollo program's investment in microelectronics. 50 years later, we're still coasting on this technology. You do this, and we're going to be able to coast for another 50 years of innovation from our industry, from our academic system, based on meeting the challenges of getting people there and back safely. So the investment that we make in the space program is not being burned up off the planet. It's coming back into our economy and our academic system and institutions like IHMC here. So following in the tracks of our rovers is an imperative. And, you know, I don't want to see a history book written 200 years from now that says, you know, the first country, the first coalition to go to Mars was the Communist Chinese Party. That's my preference. I would not like to see the history unfold that way. Uh, you might imagine a lot of bad things happening if the Chinese are in control of a lot of resources in space. Um, so I'd welcome them as partners. They have a top secret program run by their military right now. We need to bring them into the fold and, and have them loosen up a bit. I hope they will do that. And then they could join this, this, this most challenging and most um, consequential of space efforts in the 21st century. So here's a view from the... Um, Curiosity rover in Gale Crater on Mars. Uh, there's a favorite author of mine called um, Daniel Borston. He died a few years ago. He was once the librarian of Congress. And he wrote a really neat book called The Discoverers. It's about that thick. About the age of exploration in the 14 and 1500s as we unlock the secrets of the new world. And he wrote a passage in that book that says, uh, exploration is a story without an end. All the world is an America waiting to be revealed. Because the most promising words ever written on the maps of human knowledge are terra incognita, which means unknown territory. And that has been true in human history for thousands of years. If there's a place that's unknown that offers new opportunities and resources, people have gone there. And that's why we're here in Florida today. So I think in the 21st century, we're going to go to another brand of unknown territory. And then we'll see, just like in the Missouri Purchase, we'll see how our nation and our partners benefit from uncovering those new lands, those new territories out there in space. And with that, I want to thank you for coming tonight. Welcome. If you've got questions, I'm happy to take a few. We have perhaps about five to 10 minutes to take questions. Yep. So I'm happy to do that. Raise your hand and we'll get to you as soon as I can. Okay, hold on one second, speak. All right. Dr. Jones, thank you very much for coming to Ocala, and thank you for your service and your dedication. I think a lot of us would like to walk in space if possible. Yes. Is there any applications commercially where the Americans or humans can be able to walk in space? And can you also tell us about your experience yourself walking in space? Oh, best job for an astronaut, believe me. Um, and it was always a dream of mine to get to do that. So I was very lucky that I actually did get assigned to help build the station and do those spacewalks. I had three of them, 19 hours worth on the space station. So it's the coolest astronaut job. You almost, you know, you're pinching yourself through the spacesuit. Am I awake? Am I awake? Am I dreaming? Am I dreaming? So uh, you're out there and you're wearing a spacesuit with you inside it that weighs about 450 pounds. It's like, a, it's like wearing, stepping inside and putting on a refrigerator. But it's weightless. 
So you can move it around with just your fingertips. Isaac Newton says once you get an object moving that's that massive, you have to apply the same force to stop it from moving. And so uh, that, that's the, Newton's first law of motion. And your muscles have to provide the force. So it's very fatiguing after six to seven hours of moving your refrigerator around with your fingertips. Those are your forearm muscles that are called into play and your shoulders. That's how you do almost all your work out there. The suit is stiff and it's difficult to make the arms go where you want them when you want to work. Uh, it's designed to put the arms sort of right here in front of you. But if you want to move them around or adjust your helmet lights or get tools off your belt, you've got to move those stiff arms around. And the, the gloves are stiff and thick, and so you're constantly flexing against that stiffness. So that's what makes the challenge physical as well as mental out there. So, but it's exhilarating because you can't believe you're piloting your own little spaceship around a space station and you're looking out, there's the Earth filling half the sky and there's the rest of the universe off in that direction. So it's extraordinary experience. There's a tourist mission that um, Mr. Musk has had SpaceX sign up, which is gonna have some, some four crew members go out um, into Earth orbit and they're gonna do the first private spacewalk. So it's gonna be possible for people in the future. As it's gonna take a generation, but the price will come down so that an orbital vacation might be like a trip to Antarctica today. So I think that's gonna happen in 25 years or so. You'll be able to take a life, once in a lifetime trip to space to see the view of our home planet. Maybe um, wealthier people will go around the moon or even land on the moon as tourists in, in a generation or so. So that's all gonna happen. Um, the, the best analogy in the near term for the spacewalking experience is to go get in the pool on a hot summer day and float on your back, take a big, big deep breath, <gasps> float on your back and look at the sky and pretend that those blue skies and the white clouds are the earth and float on the surface of the pool for a minute and just let the water support you and that's the same feeling of free fall that you get with your whole body effortlessly supported except that in space you're not wet. So, so that's the closest I can tell school kids to do is to go experience it like that. But yeah, it's going to be um, maybe a theme park ride in the next 10 or 20 years. You go over to Universal Studios, right, and put on a spacesuit and do something similar. I did all my training underwater uh, in the big pool back in Houston. And that's pretty close to making your suit behave the way it does in space. Uh, but if you drop your hammer, it goes to the bottom of the pool. And you can tell when you're in that suit underwater which way is down and which way is up. That's not true in space. So it's a facsimile of, a reasonable facsimile of free fall, but it's not the, the, the true imitation of it. Okay, another question. Abigail. Yeah. Uh, I know we already talked before, but I have another question. Um, of, all the, of, all, of the four missions you flew, uh, what was your favorite part of uh, being on the shuttle and working and living in space? Uh, favorite part of the experience, aside from looking at the Earth, which is extraordinary, and, and it always changes, it's always lovely, and you can't, you have to pull yourself away from the windows to go to work, which is your, your purpose for being up there. But the best part of the whole experience was the people that I flew with. So I flew with 20 other astronauts on those four flights, uh, including three on the space station, and when you train with your crewmates for a year or two years, or sometimes, in my case, three years, um, you get to understand those people so well and their strengths and weaknesses and you're a team and you're all trying to achieve the same goal together, you can read their thoughts. You can look at their face and know exactly what their emotions are. And so they're better, they're closer to you than your brothers and sisters are. So it's an extraordinary bond that builds up among the, t the teammates on a shuttle crew or a station crew. And you know, those friendships that I made are gonna last me for the rest of my life. So that was the biggest rewarding part of space flight for me was being that close to people we all recognize that by ourselves, we couldn't get anything done of consequence up there. Um, but with five of us at the space station and our machinery, we could actually install a laboratory on the space station. It was amazing that we could do that. Hardly believable. So that was the best part of it. Okay. Yeah. Here. Here you go. And Laura, you let me know when we have to um, yes, come I to will. the last question, okay? I will. Okay. Yes. What do you do to mitigate cosmic rays? while you're up there, and all, the second question is, when astronauts come back to Earth, long term, are they, what kind of effects are they finding from that exposure? Okay, um, we're in low Earth orbit on the space station. Uh, most of the cosmic rays are deflected away by the geomagnetic field of the Earth, 
but some come down to that detector, the AMS that we talked about at the beginning. And so you do get uh, a higher radiation dose. I showed it in that, in that graph that it's a little bit higher than the average nuclear worker down here on the ground. Um, but at that level, there's a margin for safety built into that standard. So the people on the space station, even though they get the equivalent of a chest X-ray every day, they still don't have any long-term bad consequences from that. Once you leave that geomagnetic sheath around the Earth behind, the Apollo guys did that, future Mars explorers, asteroid explorers, they're going to do that. Um, you're going to be exposed to that cosmic ray bath, and it's going to have deleterious effects. Um, over time, there's probably just going to be, first of all, larger cancer risk if you're not protected. Uh, so that means on the moon and on the asteroids and on Mars, you would live underground with several meters of dirt between you and those cosmic rays. That'll work. That's good shielding. But you can't build a spaceship with thick enough walls to stop the cosmic rays. It just gets too heavy to fly. And so your spaceship can't protect you. On the space station, they're testing things like um, having them wear uh, uh, polyethylene vests, which stop some of the cosmic ray penetration with the plastic material. That's pretty decent light elements there that stop some radiation exposure. Um, if there was a solar storm on the way to Mars, you would retreat into a section of the spaceship that was heavily shielded by water, which is another good shielding material, or, or liquid hydrogen, which is even better. That's your rocket fuel. So you could stay in the storm shelter for a couple, three days till the storm passes. That's okay. But cosmic rays, they don't, they don't pass. They're always on, always flying through space and penetrating your body. So the only solution is to reduce your exposure and live underground. So like, again, on the movie The Martian, a really fun movie that I enjoyed, he, you can't spend six months driving around on the surface of Mars. You're going to be dead. Uh, if not right then, several years later from the cancer incidents that would increase. So that's a really naughty problem. So live underground, have a nice periscope to look around. You know, and once, once every two weeks, you go out on a Mars walk in your spacesuit. So we'll, we can take one more question, but before the last question, I want to tell you that um, you can answer, have a lot of your questions answered in the book, Ask the Astronaut. And um, we are, uh, Tom will sign books over here for a little bit, um, of, and we have his books here, and all of the proceeds from the book sales go to the IHMC Kids Education Program. So anyway, so, um, one last question. Is there a last question? Oh. I have a Newtonian question. You're suggesting that um, we could use a nuclear reactor to, to speed the ship yes. to Mars faster. Mm -hmm. The thing that I've never understood about the propulsion systems is once you get it going really fast, you shouldn't have to do anything more, right? There's nothing, there's no friction, there's nothing right. slowing you, you it coast. down. Yeah, you put a big impulse in at the beginning to inject you on a Mars orbit, and then you shut the engines down. So what the, the thing about the nuclear reactor is just to get it going faster, but it doesn't have to keep running. It doesn't know? keep running, no. The, it would run out of propellant you know, way before you got to Mars. So the idea is to give a big burst of high efficiency thrust from the nuclear uh, engine. So it throws the exhaust out about twice the speed of what my shuttle engines uh, did. And that's a more efficient propulsion system. It uses half the fuel to get to a given speed, for example. So you cut the trip time in half as another choice. So if you take the same amount of rocket fuel, you'll cut the trip time in half by burning it at the beginning of the voyage. Then when you get there, you turn your engine around, point right. it in your direction of travel, and retrofire to in get into Mars orbit. Um, we can't launch a nuclear engine from Florida here because there'd be the potential of contamination from the exhaust. So those engines will only be used in space away from the, the biosphere of the Earth. Does that answer your question? Sure. Thank you. There's other stuff we can talk about over the table, like uh, nuclear electric propulsion, if you want to talk about that. Okay. All right, you guys. Thank you. It's been wonderful having you. Thanks a lot.